Um, at this point, I'm going to go back to the video again, and I'm going to show you uh, uh, something uploaded from Chris Doyle. He is the director of the uh, London-based Council for Arab-British Understanding. Britain has to change its historic stance towards the region, where it's backed up dinosaur regimes, it's propped them up, kept them in power, even put them in power on certain occasions, but hasn't really developed a meaningful relationship with the peoples. And this is what matters. We have to change the way we operate, see the region in a different way, respect the peoples. Now, when we saw our Prime Minister, David Cameron, going out to Egypt, my first reaction was fantastic. He was going there just after Mubarak had been uh, kicked out by the people. He was the first senior European Western leader to do so. And he goes to Tahrir Square and he meets these fantastic uh, young men and women who've been protesting. He pays great tribute to them. And I thought, wonderful. And then the next thing you hear, that he was accompanied by a whole coterie of arms dealers, the people, the companies who'd been selling the very, very things that these brave young uh, protesters had been confronting all across Egypt and not just in Egypt. And what message, what message does this send out to peoples across the region? So I'm going to ask uh, Shadi Hamad, uh, you recently uh, wrote an editorial for Salon magazine where you suggested that Obama should apologize uh, to the Arab world. So I'll ask you first, although I could have asked Abdel, uh, do, Western nations, <laughs> do, we, do Western nations really care about Arab democracy? Yeah, well, there's no doubt that, let's just focus on the U.S. for a second. The U.S. has been behind the curve in nearly every single Arab country the past few months. And I challenge anyone in this room to come up with even one exception. And there is a conflict between American interests and American ideals, as Matt said. And I think Bahrain is the most obvious example of this. Bahrain has actually been, the Bahraini regime has been responsible for the highest per capita arrests in, in the region. Uh, more than 3,000 people in a very small population. And also, if you take the per capita deaths, it's number two, only behind Libya. So I think we have to be very forthright about what we've seen in Bahrain. Unfortunately, um, to his credit, Obama did criticize the Bahraini leadership in his speech, but he didn't, but what happens after that? And this is a challenge that U.S. administrations always have. They're very good at rhetoric, but what's the follow through? What's the roadmap for change? And Obama didn't lay that out. What, one thing that actually did happen is there was a quasi-apology by George Bush Jr. when yeah. he laid out his freedom agenda. He said, we, we have obstructed the, the development of d democracy. We have been um, supporting dictatorships and we're going to change. We're going to support democracy in the Arab world from now on. Now, what, what essentially happened is, is the election of Hamas, the, the, the performance of the Muslim Brotherhood, and then, and then the democracy agenda did <coughs> kind of quiet down in the Bush administration. And what that tells us is something very simple. If the competition is between America's will or, or good intentions or, or ideals versus the tenacity and inertia of a dictatorship, dictatorship wins every time and it always will. But when the competition is the will of the people who are actually the direct benefactors of that di dictatorship and the dictator himself, in many cases, the people actually win. I really enjoyed what, uh, what <coughs> Dalia and Shadi had said. I uh, enjoyed listening to it. I agree with them. Uh, and I, I think it's about time that the US and other powers recognize some of the past mistakes and the profound um, significance of this moment and what it means for the region. There's only five countries right now that are undergoing the sort of dynamic change or have the possibility of completing this change to where they look, begin to look like Egypt and Tunisia. Many others will invariably follow. The US will be tested, not just in Bahrain, but will be tested in many other countries, including some of the neighboring countries where it has geopolitical interests uh, and where it cannot only look at the question of democratization or human rights or freedoms without also making some tough choices on its relationship 
with these uh, other countries. Economic interests are at stake, military interests are at stake. Uh, these are incredibly difficult decisions. I, and I would not, under any circumstance, want to be sitting in a room around a table having to make choices at a given moment between what matters the most here and how I view my relationship with my partner in the region, especially if it's a partner that I disagree with uh, in terms of how they, uh, they've organized themselves, govern themselves. These are incredibly <coughs> tough choices. I think, though, uh, and I hope that Chadi and Delhi are right, that perhaps the tide has changed, not only within the US administration, but within the body politic that helps shape policy in the US vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world, whereby the choices in favor of good governance, in favor of human rights, in favor of freedom, are going to be the choices that will consistently be made. I, I'm 100% I'm you know, convinced that the West and the United States in particular, they don't want the Arab world to enjoy democracy. I'll tell you why. If we have democracy in Saudi Arabia, the people of Saudi Arabia, you know, they will have elected parliament. And this elected parliament will say to the government, why shall we sell our oil cheaply? You know, we, you know, our population now is about 20 million. You know, honestly, I was shocked the other day, you know, when I, I was reading uh, that uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, Khan Dela, after, after about 50 years, they discovered that there is a social benefit. There is unemployment benefits. There were people unemployed, and the government doesn't help them. This is the wealthiest country in the Middle East. We in, the, in Britain, for example, if I'm unemployed, I go to the, you know, uh, the office, uh, the you know the social uh, security office, and I will have money. I will have a salary to keep my, my, my family. But in Saudi Arabia, wasn't like that. So they asked the unemployed people to go and apply for this social benefit. I was shocked to hear that three and a half million Saudi applied for this benefit. Three and a half million. So imagine those people. They need jobs. They need money. They wouldn't accept the barrel of oil to be, say, you know, $75 a barrel or $80 a barrel. They want to have the maximum of this depleted wealth, which could disappear in 40 years or 40, 50 years' time. So because of this, because of Israel and because of oil, I don't believe there is a true tendency, American tendency, to a true democracy in our part of the world. Yeah, but if I could just very quickly, I mean, I think Americans are starting to realize that the old paradigm failed, this paradigm of focusing on stability over everything else. What did it get the U.S.? The region's falling apart now. There's civil war in one country, Syria might fall, God knows tomorrow. So it's very clear now that the last 50 years, you know, if we look at it kind of in a broader historical perspective, has it really served American interests from a long-term perspective? And I think also the last place the U.S. wants to be is on the wrong side of history. And I think now there's a real threat. There's a real possibility that Arabs will say, you know, who supported us in our struggle for freedom? The U.S. wasn't there with us. That's going to hurt America's interests.